Ideas.com podcast. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of InvestorIdeas.com podcast. In today's podcast, we'll be looking at a few public as well as private company announcements from Chiron Life Sciences Corporation, trading on the TSX Venture as KHRN and the OTCQX as KHRNF. Fire and Flower Holdings Corporation trading on the TSX as FAF and the OTCQX as FFLWF. Ayurican Holdings Corporation trading on the CSE as AYUR as well as SuperRet. First, looking at Chiron Life Sciences Corporation, who announced the release of its inaugural Environmental, Social, and Governments Report, which captures a period between January 1st, 2020 to December 31st of 2020. And this showcases the company's commitment to improving environmental practices along with lives of patients, employees, local communities, shareholders, and other stakeholders. And the report outlines actions and initiatives undertaken in 2020 to strengthen ESG practices throughout the company's operations and supply chain, along with Chiron's goals for 2021 and 2022. At Chiron, sustainability is embedded in our DNA with the common belief that strong ESG policies improve performance, loyalty, and innovation while reducing corporate risks and capital costs. Our inaugural ESG report demonstrates our dedication to strong environmental, social, and governance principles as we deliver on our mission of improving lives through cannabis. I'm proud of how our team rose to the challenges of 2020, achieving incredible milestones in an unprecedented year, commented Alvaro Torres, CEO and Director. Now, Alvaro continued, increasingly institutional investors are using ESG principles to guide investment decisions, and as one of the first global cannabis companies to publish an ESG report, we've achieved another corporate milestone that distinguishes us as an industry leader and market disruptor. And we've set ambitious ESG goals for the next two years, and I'm confident that our team will deliver on these objectives. Uh, So some of the highlights uh, included... A few different levels. Um, so obviously, they did uh, commission Solar Park to reduce energy consumption at a product at their production facility by up to forty percent. Um, secured eighty eight percent of production supplies from local suppliers and employed seventy four percent local residents at the company's production facility. Had a positive impact on local communities with sixty one percent of surveyed residents indicating that the company has had positive impact on the community, um, as well as a few other highlights there. Now in 2020, global sustainable funds attracted more than $150 billion in fund flows with COVID-19 serving as a catalyst for sustainability investing. And additionally, according to RBC Global Asset Management's Response Investment Survey of 2019, 70% of institutional investors surveyed use ESG principles when they invest. And the top three reasons to apply ESG principles when investing were cited as lower risk, improved returns, and acting in the client's interest. Uh, so Chiron Life Sciences, again, a company that obviously I've paid attention to for quite some time. Uh, And now being one of the first or few in the cannabis industry to actually release their ESG report. Uh, And again, they are a company that has been focusing on doing as much as possible. Again, many of the companies within the cannabis space boast the same type of initiatives, though few of them actually go to the same extent, perhaps, as a Chiron Life Sciences. I think the biggest difference there is being based in Colombia. Um, There was a lot more restrictions and regulations in place for Chiron to become the company they were today, and they had to work very much hand-in-hand with the government and really ensure that every community that they touched was being positively impacted by their business as opposed to negative impacted. Um, The same is marginally said for most U.S. and Canadian operations, but the comparison is that, again, when it comes to social responsibility and environmental impact, it's not as big of a priority for many of these companies, and it's also not demanded as as high of an extent um, by the government or by local regulators. So I do think that being based in Colombia has just been beneficial to them in the long term. Um, And again, there's also been some releases lately uh, talking about how Colombian cannabis companies are now poised to sort of take over the import-export market over Canadian companies that they've been competing with. Obviously, um, that still has yet to be determined, and it'll depend on also how much European producers uh, sort of build up their own production capacities over the next year to two years. Um, But for right now, there's definitely close to a neck and neck competition when it comes to exports out of Colombia and exports out of Canada going to the EU marketplace. So another good thing for Chiron Life Sciences and again, having their environmental and social and governance principles in line is only going to be more beneficial for them working with EU governments who again are also focusing on these same sort of initiatives. 
Looking next at Fire and Flower Holdings Corporation, who announced that strategic license partner American Acres Managers has now officially changed its name to Fire and Flower U.S. Holdings and has opened its first Fire and Flower branded store in Palm Springs, California. So Fire and Flower announced this strategic entry into the U.S. cannabis market in February of this year when it signed a licensing agreement with American Acres to license its Fire and Flower brand, store operating system, and high fire technology platform for dispensaries in California, Arizona, and Nevada. And through this licensing arrangement, American Acres is expanding Fire and Flower's retail footprint into the U.S. with the rollout of new Fire and Flower stores in targeted high-growth markets to deliver best-in-class technology and retail functionality to U.S. cannabis consumers. Now, we've reached a significant milestone for our company as we've officially planted our roots in the U.S. cannabis market through our strategic partner, American Acres, stated Trevor Fencott, Chief Executive Officer of Fire and Flower. Our high fire cannabis digital retail and analytics platform has propelled our growth and leadership position in Canada, allowing us to successfully capture consumer buying behaviors and apply predictive and real time analytics, unlike any of our other competitors. And as we have continued to demonstrate the value of our technology through the rapid expansion of our multi banner retail network of over 85 stores throughout Canada, the expansion of our brand and technology into the U.S. is the next step in our evolution. We're pleased to now be delivering the same omni-channel, convenience-oriented cannabis retail experience to U.S. consumers and pave the way for the future of cannabis retail in the U.S. as legislation continues to develop. So in connection with entering into the licensing agreement with American Acres, Fire and Flower also received an option exercisable to acquire American Acres at a discount to fair market value. And the acquisition is anticipated to occur upon the federal legalization of adult use cannabis in the U.S. or when otherwise permitted by the policies of the TSX. Um, so Fire and Flower now actually has their Fire and Flower U.S. holdings up and running. Um, I do think that this is a big step forward for them, and it also is a testament to their ability of retail management within the Canadian market. Again, I've talked about them a lot when you're looking at Canadian retail. They are definitely miles ahead of most of their competitors when it comes to technology, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to data and analytics. Um, I think they're vastly ahead in that regard in that their high fire and sparks rewards programs have given them a huge data set to work with, and uh, it's allowed them to adapt to all market conditions and changes quite um, quite quickly and efficiently. Again, they were one of the first companies to have already adapted to an online retail store, to having curbside pickup, to having delivery well ahead of COVID mandates. Um, and I do think that this is kind of one of the elements that might be missing from the U.S. retail landscape is this adaptive technology and the use of data analytics in the same regard. Again, there have been some small retail stores that have implemented one or two of these elements in some fashion. But I think the biggest difference is that Fire and Flower is an established chain within Canada. Um, so they already have a huge data set to work with. And again, launching into California, Nevada and, uh, <clears throat> and Arizona. I think will be uh, give them a quick boost where suddenly they're going to have quite aggressive sales within that market. Also a really great testament to their ability to perform in very competitive landscapes. Um, again, if they can do well in Palm Springs and California and Arizona and Nevada over the next coming months to years with American Acres, I think that'll really show that obviously their retail um, strategy is effective and also dominant within even some of the most competitive and dominant cannabis uh, markets in the world. So hopefully that will go as well as anticipated. And then also that will give them a huge larger data set to work with where they can compare US and Canadian retail, um, something again that very few companies have access to or the ability to do right now other than working with companies like a BDS analytics and other competitors um, in Canada and the US. So I do think that this will be quite an aggressive step for them and definitely something to pay attention to over the next year if they do acquire um, the, uh, sorry, they do acquire American Acres as well. I mean, again, there's a lot of talk about federal legalization in the U.S., but I don't think it's going to be happening too soon as, again, the Schumer bill was not super well received. Looking next at a Uricane Holdings Corporation, who announced it's entered into a manufacturing distribution agreement with Inacan Pharma Corporation, an Israel-based pharmaceutical tech company focused on the development of several drug delivery platforms combining CBD. Now, the agreement will see a Uricane manufacture Inacan's CBD topical products consisting of its Relief and Go and Sheer Beauty Skin Care collections. And Iuracan will also act as the exclusive Canadian distributor for the products and will pay royalties to Inacan based on the net sales of the products sold by Iuracan in the Canadian recreational and medical cannabis markets. 
A Uricam is excited for the opportunity to manufacture and introduce Inacan's sheer beauty and skincare line, as well as their relief and go topical products in Canada. And we believe that Inacan patent patient Inacan's patent pending CBD integrated products will be some of the highest quality CBD products to enter the market to date. Now, the pharmaceutical expertise of Inacan, together with IRCAN's large extraction capacity and manufacturing capabilities, will be combined to bring top line products to market at scale and at price points that will allow for wide market access. Now, this agreement also positions both companies for CBD deregulation, allowing a Uricam and Inacan CBD products to be further scaled through national retailers at such time, says CEO of Uricam, Igal Sudman. Uh, so, this is kind of one of the few things where I've seen an Israeli-based brand coming into the Canadian market. Um, again, it's sort of a testament to the Israeli-based pharmaceutical sector and cannabinoid sector picking up. You're now seeing these companies have created some pretty top-line, top-tier products for the medical market. Um, obviously, that can be reformatted to fit the recreational market in Canada. Uh, it'll also be interesting to see what price points they can compete at if they are able to go so much lower as I've anticipated with the Israeli cannabis products in the future. Um, and it'll also be interesting to see again with CBD topicals still in massively underserved market in Canada and in the US. Um, so it'll also be interesting to see how those compare against some of the Canadian counterparts that are already in that industry. Um, and I do think that in general, this is what you're going to start seeing over the next few years as products coming from all over the world different price points, different formats, um, and really different technology uses. As again, when you're looking at Israel, some of the technology implementations that they have there are miles ahead of some of the innovations that you're seeing in Canada and the US. And that just comes from them working with cannabinoids for a much longer period of time. So when it comes to the scientific side of this industry, I think Israel is much further ahead than most of North America. When it comes to production capacity and really high quality, high grade flour from outdoor grows um, or from indoor grows as well, I think that Israel and Colombia and most of Latin America is another big competitor on a global scale. Again, most of the policies for each government right now, uh, for each you know market when you're looking at Canada or the US is very protectionist at the moment. Uh, but again, that could change over time as more and more areas of the world begin to legalize. It could turn into more of a general commodity, um, in which case you might start seeing a little bit more of that global competition, which will be interesting to see how that turns out. Lastly today, looking at Superette, who opened its Sip and Smoke, a first-of-its-kind express cannabis retail co concept located in Toronto's Trinity Bellwoods Park. Now, once again, completely reimagining the existing cannabis retail experience, Superette Sip and Smoke is a 690 square foot kiosk serving only pre rolls and infused beverages that are meant to be enjoyed at the park. And Superette Bellwood's walk up location and cafeteria style shopping experience pushed the boundaries to demonstrate true innovation in customer journey, product curation, and retail principles for an easy access, smaller footprint cannabis shop. So, the Bellwood's Parkside Grab and Grow Express concept takes inspiration from European outdoor kiosks known as Trink Hall, along with the classic corner and convenience stores. So the Sip and Smoke features all the hallmarks of Superette's nostalgic retail environments, featuring a sunny color palette and old-school white and yellow checkerboard tile floor as a tribute to the beloved convenience store brands, and the first dispensary to have an intentionally narrow product focus. The Bellwood Sip and Smoke exclusively sells a curated selection of ready-to-consume pre-rolls and beverages, staying true to the convenience store concept, and it does not have a menu. Instead, customers pick up a tray and head down the line inspired by the easy flow of a cafeteria shopping with their eyes while guided by a bud tender. And in addition to the hyper-focused cannabis product offering, customers can pick up other park-ready lifestyle items, including portable speakers, blankets, bottle openers, and totes from Superette's cut-followed product line to enjoy this park. We're thrilled to finally be opening our doors in one of the most iconic spots in the city. Despite the steady influx of cannabis shops in the neighborhood, it was important for Superette to show up in a way that was uniquely ourselves. Welcome to Sip and Smoke, the perfect parkside shop, commented Mimi Lam, the chief executive officer. Uh, so this is something that I've been so excited for and very glad that it is now kind of here in some form. Um, which is, again, starting to see the move towards consumption and consumption lounges. Obviously, again, this is a far step away from that, but it is heading into that direction. So having one of these convenience store kiosk setups in the middle of a park where people can pick up these beverages, go grab a blanket and sit down and enjoy their cannabis outside. 
um, I do think is going to be something that hopefully will gain good attention. And I do think that this is what's going to start normalizing cannabis in many people's eyes is having it in your face, not hidden away, but right in your face where you have to accept that many people enjoy this, just like many people enjoy alcohol. And I do find that there is still a double standard when it comes to so many people who consume alcohol on a regular basis, who are massively skeptical of cannabis and cannabis related products. And the hypocrisy of that is basically impossible to understand. Um, but it's still very real. And I do think that allowing these types of stores to start opening up and having it front and forward um, and showing that many people can enjoy themselves quite comfortably. They're not a menace. They don't cause any sort of inconvenience. I think obviously they'll probably sell more beverages than they will joints, I think, out of this location, um, because I do think that in general, people will choose the more discreet and less overtly um, in your face option, which again, when you're smoking anything, uh, even if it's cannabis, people will smell it, people will look at you. Um, and I do think that many people just want to enjoy their time outside. So they'll probably sell more beverages, which will also be great for the beverage side of this industry, which again, is starting to pick up more and more in Canada. I do think that the next big step to make that go much larger is going to be adjusting dosages. So allowing for up to 100 milligram or 200 milligram bottle options, um, allowing for more concentrated forms, allowing for more terpene enhanced forms, and uh, eventually having a wide array. And I do think that right now the consumer base is educated enough to understand different dosage levels. I don't think it takes a genius to understand the difference between 10 and 100 milligrams. Um, I think that that's easy enough to explain in a bud tender experience, even if it's at one of these kiosks. And I also do think that in general now, people have figured out their dosage levels on a much more understandable level. Um, again, people have had years now to be exposed to these products to figure out what is going to work for them, what they like and what they find comfortable. And eventually, once you add those higher dosage formats, um, I think people will be more willing to experiment with higher formats and with different product categories now that they've become comfortable with cannabinoids in general. So I think that this is the first step towards eventually having consumption lounges in Canada. Again, there are some of those that are going to be opening up in Vegas this year. And I do think that that will also be a huge momentum push for the U.S. to start allowing for consumption lounges on a massive scale. Um, but I do think that that's the next big thing that you're going to see. You have so many people who are working with infused beverages, with infused foods, so many people who are even chefs out there who are working with terpenes and pairing them with proper dishes now. Um, and I do think that as that picks up, eventually what you're going to see is the separate version of the sort of food and beverage industry uh, show up where you are going to see some companies decide to side with cannabis over alcohol. And I do think that that is a smarter and easier choice for many restaurants or hospitality industry businesses to take as again you look at all of the potential downfalls you could face with alcohol you have faced drunk driving you face violence um, people throwing up people passing out people forgetting to pay their bills people being aggressive um, people being too drunk to understand what the hell they're doing you have to kick people out there's a much more high risk environment in dealing with alcohol than your comparison of a counterpart with cannabinoids. If you are having infused drinks and infused food versus open alcohol in your restaurant, it might be a lot easier to deal with. Um, again, your customer base, if they get too high, is just gonna be a little sleepy, quite docile. Um, they're not gonna forget where they are. There could be some, some rare cases of people sort of freaking out and having panic attacks. But again, there's a much higher concentration of that with people freaking out and causing scenes with alcohol than there is with people overdoing it on cannabis. So I think in the long term, this is going to be the shift that is going to happen. It is an inevitability, I think, at this point, not a uh, if it will happen, more of a case of when. And I do think stores like Superette, Sip and Smoke now are going to be sort of the gateway to that industry picking up over the next few years. That's all for today's podcast. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. That's all for today's podcast. Podcast is now a certified word trademark on the blockchain through Cognate Incorporated CM certification. InvestorIdeas.com podcasts are also available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and TuneIn. If you'd like to be a guest or sponsor of this podcast, please contact InvestorIdeas.com. Investor Ideas reminds all listeners to read our disclaimers and disclosures on the InvestorIdeas.com website. And this podcast is not an endorsement to buy products or services or securities. 
Investors are reminded that all investments involve risk and possible loss of investment. Investor Ideas does not condone the use of cannabis except where permissible by law. Our site does not possess, distribute, or sell cannabis products.